Can you briefly, if it's just as a small tangent, comment on your feelings about GPT-4? So just that you're impressed by this rate of progress, but where where is it? Can GPT-4 reason? What are like the intuitions? What are human interpretable words you can assign to the capabilities of GPT-4 that makes you so damn impressed with it? I'm both very excited about it and terrified. It's an interesting mixture of emotions. All the best things in life include those two somehow. Yeah, I can absolutely reason. Anyone who hasn't played with it, I highly recommend doing that before dissing it. It uh, can do quite quite remarkable reasoning. Uh, I've had to do a lot of things, which I realized I couldn't do that myself that well, even. And, and it obviously does it dramatically faster than we do too, when you watch a type. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's doing that while servicing a massive number of other humans at, at the same time. At the same time, it cannot reason as well as uh, a human can on some tasks, just because it's obviously a limitation from its architecture. You know, we have in our heads what in geek speak is called a recurrent neural network. Mm-hmm. There are loops. Information can go from this neuron to this neuron to this neuron, and then back to this one. You can like ruminate on something for a while. You can self-reflect a lot. Uh, these large language models that are they cannot like GPT four. It's it's a so-called transformer where it's just like a one-way street of information, basically. In geek speak, it's called a feed-forward neural network. And it's only so deep, so it can only do logic that's that many steps and that deep, and it's not, and you can, so you can create problems which will fail to solve, you know, for that reason. Um, but the fact that it can do so amazing things with this incredibly simple architecture already, is quite stunning, and 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 what we see in my lab at MIT when we look inside large language models to try to figure out how they're doing it, which that's the key core focus of of our research. It, it's called um, mechanistic interpretability in geek speak. You know, you have this machine that does something smart. You try to reverse reverse engineer, see how does it do it. I think of it also as artificial neuroscience. You know, that's exactly <laughs> what neuroscientists it. do with actual brains. But here you have the advantage that you can, you don't have to worry about measurement errors. You can see what every neuron is doing all the time. And, and a recurrent thing we see again and again, there's been a number of beautiful papers quite recently by, by a lot of researchers, some of them here even in this area, is where when they figure out how something is done, you can say, oh man, that's such a dumb way of doing it. And you read immediately see how it can be improved. Like, for example, there was a beautiful paper recently where they figured out how a large language model stores certain facts, like Eiffel Tower is in Paris, and they figured out exactly how it's stored. And where the proof that they understood it was they could edit it. They changed <laughs> some of the synapses in it, and then they asked it, where is the Eiffel Tower? And it said, it's in Rome. Mm-hmm. And then they asked you, you know, how do you get there? Oh, how do you get there from Germany? Oh, you take this train and the Roma Termini train station and this and that. And what might you see if you're in front of it? Oh, you might see the Colosseum. <laughs> so they had edited it. So they thing. literally moved it to Rome. But it, the way that it's storing this information, it's incredibly dumb uh, for, for, for our, any, any fellow nerds listening to this. There was a big matrix and a... And roughly speaking, there are certain row and column vectors which encode these things, and they correspond very high wavelength to principal components. And it would be much more efficient for a sparse matrix just you could store it in the database, yeah. you know. And and but and everything so far we've figured out how these things do are ways where you can see they can easily be improved. And the fact that this particular architecture has some roadblocks built into it is in no way going to prevent. Um, crafty researchers from quickly finding workarounds and making other kinds of architectures sort of go all the way. So so it's, um, in, in short, it's turned out to be a lot easier to build human, close to human intelligence than we thought. And that means our runway as a species to get our shit together has, has shortened. And it seems like the scary thing about the effectiveness of large language models. Uh, so Sam Altman, I recently had a conversation with, and 
he really showed that the leap from GPT-3 to GPT-4 has to do with just a bunch of hacks, a bunch of uh, little explorations about, with a, smart researchers doing a few little fixes here and there. It's not some fundamental leap and transformation in the architecture. And more data and more compute. And more data and compute, but he said the big leaps has to do with not the data and the compute, mm -hmm. but just mm -hmm. learning this new discipline, just yeah. like you said. So researchers are going to look at these architectures and there might be big leaps where you realize, wait, why are we doing this in this dumb way? Yeah. And all of a sudden this model is 10X smarter. Yeah. And that, that can happen on any one day, on any one Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon. And then all of a sudden you have a system that's 10X smarter. Um, it seems like it's such a new discipline. It's such a yeah. new, like we understand so little about why this thing works so damn well that uh, the linear improvement of compute or exponential, but the steady improvement of compute, steady improvement of the data may not be the thing that even leads to the next leap. It could be a surprise little hack that improves everything. Or a lot of little leaps here and there because, because so much of this is out in the open also. So many smart people are looking at this and trying to figure out little leaps here and there. And uh, it becomes this sort of collective race where if a lot of people feel if I don't take the leap, someone else will. And, and this is actually very crucial for, for the other part of it. Why do we want to slow this down? So again, what this open letter is calling for is just pausing all training of uh, systems that are more powerful than GPT-4 for six months. To just give a chance for the labs to coordinate a bit on safety and, and for society to adapt, give the right incentives to the labs. Because I, you know, you've interviewed a lot of these people who lead these labs, and you know just as well as I do that they're good people. Mm -hmm. They're idealistic people. They're doing this first and foremost because they believe that AI has a huge potential to help humanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, but at the same time, they are trapped in this horrible race to the bottom. Have you read Meditations on Moloch by Scott Alexander? Yes. Yeah, it's a beautiful essay on this poem by Ginsberg where he interprets it as being about this monster. It's this game theory monster that that pits people into against each other in this this race to the bottom where everybody ultimately loses. The, yes. And it, the evil thing about this monster is even though everybody sees it and understands, they still can't get out of the race, right? Most a good fraction of all the bad things that we humans do are caused by Moloch, and I, I like uh, Scott Alexander's um, naming of the monster, so we can we humans can I think of it as an if a thing. Uh, if you look at why do we have overfishing, why do we have more generally the tragedy of the commons? Why is it that um, so? Liv Boré, I don't know if you had her on your podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's become a friend. Yeah, great. She made this awesome point recently that beauty filters yes. that a lot of female influencers feel pressure to use mm -hmm. are exactly Moloch in action again. Mm -hmm. First, nobody was using them and people saw them just the way they were. And then some of them started using it and becoming ever more plastic fantastic. And then the other ones that weren't using it started to realize that if they want to just keep their, their market share, they have to start using it too. And, that, and then you're in the situation where they're all using it. And, and none of them has any more market share or less than before. So <laughs> nobody gained anything. Everybody lost. And they have to keep becoming ever more plastic fantastic also. right? And uh, But nobody can go back to the old way because it's just <laughs> too costly. right? The, 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 Moloch is everywhere. And... Um, Moloch is not a new arrival on, on the scene either. We humans have developed a lot of collaboration mechanisms to help us fight back against Moloch through various kinds of constructive collaboration. The Soviet Union and the United States did sign a number of, ar of arms control treaties against Moloch, who was trying to stoke them into unnecessarily risky nuclear arms races, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is exactly what's happening on the AI front. This time... It's a little bit geopolitics, but it's mostly money, where there's just so much commercial pressure. You know, if you take any of these leaders of the top tech companies, 
if they just say, you know, this is too, too risky, I want to pause for six months, they're going to get a lot of pressure from shareholders and others. We're like, well, you know, if you pause, but those guys don't pause, we're, we don't want to get our lunch eaten. Yeah. And shareholders even have the power to replace the, the executives in the worst case, right? So we did this open letter because we want to help these idealistic tech executives to do what their heart tells them by providing enough public pressure on the whole sector to just pause so that they can all pause in a coordinated fashion. And I think without the public pressure, none of them can do it alone push back against their shareholders, no matter how good-hearted they are. Because Moloch is a really powerful foe. So the idea is to, for the major developers of AI systems like this, so we're talking about Microsoft, Google, uh, Meta, and anyone else? Well, OpenAI is very close with Microsoft, with Microsoft now, of course, right, yes. and there, there are plenty of, of, of smaller players. Anthro For example, Anthropic is, is very impressive. There's Conjecture. There, there's many, many, many players. I don't want to make a long list, so leave anyone out. Yeah. Uh, and um, for that reason, it's so important that uh, some coordination happens, that there's external pressure on all of them, saying you all need the pawns. Because then the the people, the, the researchers in they were, the, these organizations, who, the leaders who want to slow down a little bit, they can say to their shareholders, you know, mm -hmm. everybody's slowing down because of this pressure and it's, and it's the right thing to do. Have you seen in history there are uh, examples where it's possible to pause yes, the Moloch? Absolutely. And even like human cloning, for example, you could make so much money on human cloning. Why aren't we doing it? Because biologists thought hard about this and felt like this is way too risky. We, they got together all in the 70s in the Silomar and decided even to stop a lot more stuff also, just editing the human germline, right? Gen gene editing that goes in to our offspring and decided let's, let's, let's not do this because it's too unpredictable what it's going to lead to. We could lose control over what happens to our species. Mm -hmm. So they paused. Uh, there was a ton of money to be made there. Uh, so it's it's very doable. But you just need you need a public awareness of the of what the risks are, and the broader community coming in and saying, "Hey, let's slow down." And you know another another common pushback I get today is we we can't stop in the West because China. And in China, undoubtedly, they also get told we can't slow down because the West, because both yes. sides think they're the good guy. Yeah. But look at human cloning. You know, did China forge ahead with human cloning? There's been exactly one human cloning that's actually been done that I know of. Mm -hmm. It was done by a Chinese guy. Do you know where he is now? Where? In jail. And you know who put him there? Who? The Chinese government. Not because. Westerners said, China, look, this is... Totally... No, the Chinese government put them there because they also felt they like control, the Chinese government. If anything, maybe they are even more concerned about having control than than Western governments, have no incentive of, of just losing control over where everything is going. And you can also see the Ernie bot that uh, was released by, I believe, Baidu recently. They got a lot of pushback from the government and had to rein it in, you know, in a big way. Um, I think once this basic message comes out that this isn't an arms race, it's a suicide race, where everybody loses if anybody's AI goes out of control, it really changes the whole dynamic. It, it, it's not, it's, and I'll say this again, because this is a very basic point I think a lot of people get wrong. Because a lot of people dismiss the whole idea that AI can really get very superhuman, because they think there's something really magical about intelligence such that it can only exist in human minds, you know, because they believe that, they think it's gonna kind of get to just more or less GPT-4 plus plus, and then that's it. They don't see it as a super, as a suicide race. They think whoever gets that first, they're gonna control the world, they're gonna win. But that's not how it's gonna be. And we can talk again about the, the scientific arguments for why it's not gonna stop there, but, <clears throat> 
the way it's going to be is if if anybody completely loses control and you know you don't care if if, if some some if someone manages to take over the world who really doesn't share your goals they you probably don't really even care very much about what nationality they have you're not going to like it it's much worse than today uh, who, if it's if you live in orwellian dystopia who, who you, what do you care who created it right uh, and if someone if it goes farther and and we just lose control even to the machines so that it's not us versus them it's us versus it uh, what do you care who who created this this unaligned entity which has goals different from humans ultimately and we get marginalized we get made obsolete we get replaced it, that's why what i mean when i say it's a suicide race it's um it's kind of like we're, we're rushing towards this cliff uh, but the closer the, the cliff we get the more scenic the views are and the more money there is there and the more so, so we keep going but we have to also stop at some point right quit while we're ahead and uh it's um It's a suicide race, which cannot be won. But the way to really benefit from it is to continue developing awesome AI mm -hmm. a little bit slower so we make it safe, make sure it does the things that humans want, and create a condition where everybody wins. The te technology has shown us that, that you know geopolitics and, and politics in general is not a zero-sum game at all.